Welcome to the Rose Show podcast. Welcome to Markets, Macro, Stocks, and Trend Talk with Blue Chip Larry, also known as Larry Tentarelli. And I gave him that name, by the way. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. We hope to make this space educational and lots of fun. Quick disclaimer, please do not construe this as investment or financial advice. I'm Rosanna, your host, and I'm here with Blue Chip Larry. Many of you may know him as Larry Tentarelli of Blue Chip Daily. Larry is a highly respected and experienced trader and investor. He's been involved in the market since late 90s, I think 1998. And he's publisher of the Blue Chip Trend Report. And as a result of his vast knowledge and trading experience, he's someone I truly respect. And I trust with his trend analysis, his market commentary, technicals, and stock ideas. So it's no surprise you were named one of the top 50 Twitter accounts for investors to follow by MarketWatch. So Larry, I have to tell you personally, you're very approachable and you're always willing to help others by explaining your sound analysis. So accordingly, you were named one of the most helpful traders on Twitter by a Twitter poll. So we're so pleased to have you here this evening that you can share your market wisdom with us and your perspective on the trend and the Fed meeting and more. So let's get started. Okay, Great, so you. you're welcome. So Larry, Tell us your thoughts on Powell's speech yesterday. What was your takeaway? Yeah, I listened to it, it very, very closely. And, and I actually thought it was pretty constructive. As you know, I've been in the camp of I have not expected a Fed pivot at all. I've been very vocal about it. Inflation is still very high. And, and what I heard them say yesterday, what I heard Powell say, Two, two key things right away, and, and I posted this on the, on the members' Twitter page, was they spoke about taking into effect the cumulative effect of all of these rate hikes and, and that they're looking at being sufficiently restrictive. But here's what happened, is in July, Powell said one or two things that the market mistook as a pivot, and the market went straight up. And, and Powell obviously didn't like that because he came out late August in Jackson Hole and really put the brakes on the market. So as I listened to this press conference yesterday, he put out little glimmers of light that they're going to stop with the 75 basis point rate hikes. But as the reporters pressed him, he, he, you know, he had to come in on one side or the other. So he made it crystal clear. There's no pivot talk right now. They'll probably get to a higher rate than the markets had expected, maybe 5%, five and a quarter. But, but overall, the key thing that I heard that I wanted to hear was that the 75 basis point rate hikes are probably going to come to an end because the market, I think, can adjust to 50s, they can adjust to 25s, you know, and if we get a 50 in December and then 25s, things like that, it, it's much less stress on the system than these constant 75s. So overall, uh, I was glad that he said no pivot because I think the markets would have spiked and then given it all back later. And, and I thought overall it was a pretty good speech. I agree. Thank you so much. Now, I, uh, I took notes as well, and I went very closely with his speech. And yeah, what struck me was when he said, it's very premature to even speak about pausing. And that right there resonated because people are saying pivot, and I've never thought of pivot. When we look at the data, like in July, when he said data dependence, and I think the market and many people misunderstood that. And I actually came out and I tweeted about that. And I spoke about it at the time that data dependence is not necessarily positive when the data is worsening and the right. inflation has gotten higher since then. So to me, that was neutral or actually a negative because the data was getting worse. We look at Cleveland Fed and we see the inflation is increasing. And if you looked recently, I check, I have to say, I actually check almost daily. I find this stuff fascinating. I love keeping track 
Um, and it's over 8% CPI year over year for October and 6.58% year over year core. That's significantly high. So in my opinion, um, they continue as planned. And he did give hopes he said December or the following after, they would slow down the rate hikes, which to me means a five, like you said, a 50 basis points. And now I'm looking at FedWatch and I see 50, 75 actually has just won the race. You know how it has percentages? It went to sure. 50% for 75 and then 40, they're very close, 49% for 50. So Seems that 75 basis points isn't necessarily off the table. And then we have the CPI next week, uh, next Thursday, actually, at 830. And we'll see. I'm thinking we get, you know, at least an 8% print there. And that's significantly high. So, yes, agree completely. We've been in the same camp together. And I think we'll re we will remain um, until we see this data change or improve. Um, now, the quantum tighten the, the quantitative tightening as well is significant. Um, have you, I don't know if you've been looking, I, I actually just checked recently, we're looking at about 95 billion for the month of reduction. I mean, November is a big month for treasuries as well. I mean, that's a lot of tightening. And, and I think that that has a very strong effect on the market. Uh, what are your thoughts on that tightening liquidity? You know, I don't pay attention to the QC, to the QT data. I know that they're out there. But, but what I see in, in the market is a, a very, very wide spread. Because if you look at these sectors like energy and healthcare, they, they're making new highs. So even though inflation's high, they're, they're unwinding this, the QE, they've got QT going. There's still such a widespread in the markets. I think that these tech stocks right now have no bottom. And, yes. and I, look, I looked after hours and it looks like team software, they're down 19%. Cloudflare was down 13%. Twilio was down 15%. So I 15%. I think, wow. I think these companies, these high beta tech stocks that don't make any money, I think they're the ones that get squeezed the most. Or even if they do make money, if they're trading, whatever, 50, 60 times sales, 200 times earnings, they're really getting squeezed. But then if you look across the screen at stocks like Eli Lilly, Merck, the mm -hmm. stocks that make money, they pay a dividend. I, I think that those stocks can continue to do well in this tightening environment. What, what I posted tonight in the members report is I would look at, at how stocks perform today. And the stocks that performed well, I would expect them to continue to do well in this tightening cycle. Now, obviously there's gonna be pullbacks, there's gonna be volatility, but really healthcare, energy, industrials have been holding up really well. So I think if you focus, on, if people focus on those stocks that have been holding up in this environment, I think that they could continue to outperform through this tightening cycle. And this tightening cycle, before they actually cut, and, and none of us knows what the economy is going to look like in, in two months or six months, but, but I expect, because inflation is so high, that even if they get to the end of the hiking cycle, and, and it might be 5%, 5 and a quarter, whatever mm -hmm. it is, I think they're going to still have to keep those rates high to, to get that inflation down. So I, I don't, so I would look at what's working right now and what's not working right now. And I would expect exactly. those trends to continue for a while. I agree with you completely. I think that we're going to be seeing this last much longer than many had originally thought. And there are stocks that are working. Agree completely. I mean, look at even GIS. I mean, what a lovely chart that one has. Um, Archer Daniels, um, you know, CAT, you know, the industrials. Great. Sure. I know you mentioned those. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you know, it's an interesting, yeah, 
you, you, you mentioned excellent. I love you using the word high beta because I actually pulled up the chart on the SPLV, that's the S&P low volatility ratio with the SPHB, the S&P high beta. And you see a significant uh, difference in there. The low volatility is increasing significantly. And the high beta, as you exactly said, is decreasing sub significantly. So there's a shift. There are stocks that are working. You just have to be selective in the stocks that are. And man, that Twilio, I'm looking at it now that you mention it, 21% down. I don't know what they reported. I do know last quarter was not a good quarter and right. their earnings report. And I don't like the way the direction they were headed with their decreasing margins and uh, they had low guidance and, and so forth. So I can only imagine what came uh, from this recent report and agree with you, these tech and these growth are just out of favor, and they probably will be for some time. So that's what I want to dig into. I want to start with your thoughts of the anal your analysis of the trend. And let's begin with the indices. You make you had a great call. I have to tell everyone. October 17th, you called the SPY, the SPX 3900 level. And it hit it nine days later. So that was a great call. Thank you. And so could you, you're welcome. And could you please tell us your thoughts on the indices, SPX, the Dow, the NASDAQ, which is pulling down SPX, and IWM, please? Sure. So I, I don't really like the indices right here. I, I had SPY and I sold it last week, and I rolled that into DIA, which is the Dow Industrial. So the, the way that I've got these sectors ranked is NASDAQ 100 is by far the lowest. From a technical perspective, it, it couldn't even get over the 200-day moving, the 50-day moving average mm -hmm. last week, the climbing 50-day. The, these stocks right now are, are in free fall, and it's really surprised me. When Amazon was down 19% last week after earnings, I did, I did not expect to see that whatsoever. But if you look at the Amazon chart right now, it's, it's just fallen apart. The Google chart has fallen apart. The bottoms come out of these stocks. And, and I think for when, when I see that type of selling, that tells me that, that fund managers right now are selling stocks like Amazon and Google who mm -hmm. are, are leaders. No, no fear whatsoever of missing any upside. They are just throwing these stocks out by the wayside. So I don't know when that stops, but I, I've got triple Q ranked the lowest. I've got the S&P 500 ranked next to lowest. If I had mm -hmm. to own an index, and I do have the one index, I've got DIA, mm -hmm. and, and DIA recently reclaimed the 200-day moving average, it pulled back yesterday. It's under the 200-day right now. But it's in, in this environment, I think that stocks that are, are better established, that have earnings, and that are, are traditionally more reliable, I think that's a better group. So I got out of SPY last week because I didn't want anything, I didn't want to have anything to do with these mega cap techs. Now, obviously... The Dow has Apple. Uh, it's got Microsoft that's in there. But those are the only two real. You, you've got to have some tech. But the biggest weighting in the Dow is actually healthcare. Healthcare yes. generally holds up very well in an economic slowdown because it's defensive. But they also have, have some growth characteristics. So I, I do have DIA. And that's like my basic core position right now, but that's how I'd rank them, rank them out. I've, I have small caps on watch. They haven't been able to reclaim the 200 day moving average yet. And I didn't like the, the 3% and change drawdown yesterday. What, what I'm yes. looking with, with my positions right here, I'm looking for lower volatility positions that don't get shaken up as much in these high volatility sell-offs. Agree. 
Absolutely. You know, it's an interesting that you mentioned that because the SPYG to SPYV ratio is declining significantly. And that is the growth to value. So we see growth declining significantly and value increasing, which is due to exactly what you said, the NASDAQ versus the Dow. NASDAQ sure. is in a free fall, while the Dow has, is, is the one that has the strength. Now, you tweeted um, about Apple being the best of the mega caps. Do you think that it could maybe be the last to fall? Yes, I think Apple could, could go down too. It's, it yeah. would be tough for me to imagine Microsoft, Google, and Amazon all making new lows without Apple eventually going there. And the only reason I say that is because Apple, it's a stronger chart. It, it hasn't made a new low. It's still holding over the October 13th lows. But it, 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 it doesn't matter how good of a swimmer you are. If the stream is going down 50 miles an hour, you're going to get taken down with the current. So I, I would like to see Apple hold up but it's not anything that I'm going to put money into right here. Exactly. Agree. Thank you for that. Now, you mentioned the SPX. There's some critical levels we need to watch out for. And I believe you said 3650. Is that correct? 3650 is my real line in the sand to determine if I think this recent recovery move, at least in the S&P, is going to hold up or not. And that was the low on Friday, two weeks ago, before the Wall Street Journal put out that article that said the Fed might backpedal a little bit from 75. So just looking at the chart, if S&P holds over 36.50, then I'd give this recovery move the benefit of the doubt, but it, it's not far away. And it really depends on what happens with, with these tech stocks. Yes, and then the CPI next week, sure. if it... Uh surprises to the upside again, then we could see lower. Now we're downward, we're lower highs, lower lows. Mm. Um, so do you think that this could still be a counter trend rally? Could it possibly be a recovery? And you're, in your mind and what you're seeing, what would, I know you don't like to label the, with the words bear and, and you know bear market rally, but what would you call what we're in right now? Like a range bound? What, what words would you use to describe this? I, I think the index, I, I still think it, it is a bear market rally. And I spoke about that two weeks ago when I, when I put out that buy alert on, the, on SPX. I said, I'm, I'm just going to treat this as a counter trend rally for now. Because keep in mind, all, all bull markets start with a reversal at some point. So a, a bear market rally can eventually turn into more. But but right now with the S&P, I'm still treating it as a, a bear market rally for now. Now, if, if we start to get over 39.50 to start with, but really, just as I look at the chart, I think if the S&P closed over 4150 which is 400 points from here then i then i think i would start to think that okay that the final low might be in i i really don't think that the final low is in for the s&p mm -hmm. 500 now i still think that you can do just fine in energy stocks and healthcare stocks uh you know we have to look at the charts but it, it it's, it's going to be difficult. I think there's, there's a lot to work through in this Fed cycle because CPI, and I look at the same forecast that you do, it's projected to come in, the Cleveland Fed's calling for 8.09 for October CPI. So think about this. The Fed started the year at effectively zero. Right now, where are we? Four and a quarter, 375. Let me take a look. Right now we're at Three, 375. 375. Yes. Yeah. So they've, they've hiked 375 basis points and inflation still with, with an eight. So as far as the S&P, I'm going to treat it right now as a bear market rally that has the potential to turn into more, but it's, it's looking weak right now. 
Agree. Especially with looking at the Fed terminal rate and where we're headed with that, this high CPI and core CPI reading that we have for October and November. Looking at Cleveland Fed, November is still highly elevated as of right now, over 8% for, sure. for CPI as well. So with all those factors, I agree with you, uh, besides the fact that you're blue chip Larry, and we don't disagree <laughs> with you. <laughs> but uh, so, yes, I think it's a bear market rally and uh, the new we could see new lows. Now, when you say we could see new lows, do you mean all the ind indexes or do you just mean SP SPX and NASDAQ? I, I don't I don't know. So I think I think triple Q right now, triple Q is only six dollars above the flush out low on October 13th. So, I mean, triple wow. Q is 2%. Right there. Huh. And, and, and there's like no, just really no floor. I guess what the question would be is when you look at the Amazon chart and the Google chart and the Microsoft chart, what's, what's going to be the catalyst to make those stocks stop going down right now? I don't know. <laughs> and I don't, because here, here's what they've said. I, I think Google had their lowest growth quarter since 2013, something like that. Mm -hmm. And Amazon obviously didn't have a good earnings report because it was down 19% and it's down further since then. So I guess my question is, if, if these companies had a bad quarter and they said it's not going to get better next quarter, then what would make some what would make a fund manager go out or what would make you or I go out and buy Amazon stock right now if they said we had a bad quarter the next quarter probably won't be any better why would you buy that stock so then there's I guess no the, reason yeah yeah so I guess the question is when you look at at, at the Amazon chart and I'm looking at it right now mm -hmm. you know what would be the reason to buy a stock in a company where they said the next quarter probably won't be any better than the last quarter. I don't know the answer, but if you look at the other side, healthcare stocks, Eli Lilly, these companies are putting up big earnings numbers and they're raising guidance right now. Energy stocks are, are knocking the cover off the ball, big earnings growth. They pay a big dividend. These industrial stocks are starting to pick up. So I, I think what the market is, is going to continue to look for in this environment is cash flow. So companies that, that make money, that can pay out a dividend, because keep in mind, a, a, a dividend, if you get a stock market with a negative return, if you can get 2 or 3% or 4% from a dividend, that's a big deal. If the market's going up 40%, then nobody cares about dividends. But when the markets have been have been weaker, so what, what my plan is to really just hide out in energy stocks, healthcare stocks, uh, Archer Daniels is a good stock that you mentioned. And, and I don't know, I don't know for the Dow. I, I don't know if the it's much stronger if you look at the chart than the other two. And I guess the question is, these old economy stocks like Boeing and Caterpillar and Chevron and Goldman Sachs, can they stay strong enough to offset, mm -hmm. offset the weakness in Apple? Exactly. And Microsoft? Yeah. So, but yeah, that's I, the I, question. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm content if, if we talk in a month and I tell you that I'm just sitting in energy stocks and healthcare and the Dow, as long as I'm going in the right direction, that's fine with me. Agree. I think it's like we said, selective stocks, it's selective sectors, the ones that are demonstrating cash, cash is king. I've been saying this on spaces and tweeting for many months now. We're in a compressed margin environment. I look at earnings very closely and I see decreasing margins and we need to find companies that are not only maintaining these margins, but increasing them. And they are out there. The ones with free cash flow, free cash flow margin and, and yields increasing or at least maintaining those levels. Dividends are, are key. I mean, growth 
is down. So why hold on to a stock that's not going to give you any dividends and is just declining? It's, you know, the, the real rate of return on these stocks is, is actually, I have to say, negative. So at this point, cash shorting are, are going into these select stocks that offer dividends or that are demonstrating strong earnings and they are out there. And, you know, when we have a risk-free re rate being as high as it is, as much higher than it was, um, you know, we, we, we need to be pickier, you know, and, you know, the, I know, you know, about the equity risk premium, you know, and it's at a low right now. So valuations and price need to come down in these NASDAQ stocks, you know, yeah. so I, I don't think, that the lows are in and it could what what can stop these from going down further i agree completely so um you know let's let's look at these sectors that we're discussing a little more closely um you mentioned energy and healthcare. i agree on healthcare. these are all i mean healthcare is defensive you know value stocks like gis archer daniels and then healthcare, I've been, I've had a position for quite some time, CCRN and OPCH. And I think those are great companies and they've been, their charts are great and they've been, you know, they've been doing very well. And I do like Merck. That's what, that's one from the eighties. Actually, I remember my <laughs> father owning that one, right? Yeah, Merck, right? Merck was around in the 50s. Yeah. Ago. But I remember from the 80s, I remember my dad at the dinner table talking about buying Merck. And sure. um, so, yeah, it's uh, it's 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 nice to see that one showing strength. And then the bios are select. Bio. I've been a bio. I've been in bios for, for since the, I think May or maybe late spring sometime. I've been trading bios. Harmony's sure. been great. Caribou, I've been talking about these. I've been tweeting about them. Rhythm has been great. I sold puts there a while back when I think they had an offering. Um, so, yeah, there's definitely some winners. Um, and then the industrials as well. I mean, CAT, they had, I mean, they, they, they've been doing great. They have a lot of cash. I didn't look closely at their earnings. But, you know, these companies are, are the ones that we should be focused on. Are there any in particular that you're looking at and maybe initiating? In which sector? Any of these. Anything sure. that looks nice to you. Anything that's enticing to you. I'm, I'm, I'm looking right. So I've got, I'm holding Occidental in energy right now. Nice, I, nice. I, I, I just think that, well, it could be the ETF XLE, but I think that uh, Exxon, Chevron, Marathon Oil, Devon Energy is a little bit more volatile, but it, it's just been a great stock over the course of the year. I, I think it, it depends how much volatility uh, people want to withstand. But, but where I'm looking the closest right now and to put some money to work tomorrow is in the energy sector, more than likely either Exxon or XLE, just because right now I'm looking for lower volatility. If this was a different market, I, I would probably look at some of the higher volatility energy stocks. Uh, I'm looking at Eli Lilly very closely to start a position. Oh, but, yeah. But, but what I do in, in this volatility, because I, I think you have to trade this market differently than your standard bull market or your standard lower volatility market. So in a normal volatility market or, or an uptrend, I'll just take my full position. So if I'm looking to put 5% into Eli Lilly, I'll just buy it and set my stop and let it go. But what I found... In, in this volatility is because the sector rotation is so high at, at any given time, any stock or sector can easily pull back 5%. So what, what I would rather do is if I want to start a 5% position in Lilly or Merck or Bristol Myers or something like that, I might just buy 2 or 3% right now, see how it works out for the next few days, next week or so. And then if there's some type of a pull, you know, look to get that that 5% position may be built over the course of a month as opposed to buying it all at one time. Uh, I think the, the banks, so I've got healthcare and energy ranked number one because they're in established uptrends and they, they didn't make anywhere near new lows last week or last month with the S&P. 
Then number two, I would put industrials and financial stocks. So in the industrials, deer is one of my favorite charts. D -E. Yes. The, the defense stocks, Northrop Grumman, I think on a pullback, that's fine. General Dynamics. In, in the banks, Goldman Sachs is already mm -hmm. over the 200-day moving average. It, it held well over the June lows. Bank of America is trying to take over the 200-day JP Morgan. But that's so, so tomorrow I'm looking at energy and healthcare. And then I think if these bank stocks and industrial stocks continue to improve, then I think that's the next group that I'll take a look at. Yes, yes, very nice. I um, I was just looking at one of my tweets, and that's what I, I've been tweeting about, the same ones, Deer, D-E, CAT, S-J-M, G-I-S, all of these, healthcare. Um, cybersecurity was strong for a while, and now it's taking a beating. Um, I think uh, I, ha I am long Fortinet. I have a reduced position size there, sure. um, but I still will remain long. I think it's a great company long term, but oh, yeah. it could go it could go in the 30s. Who knows? But I'm long, so I'm not yeah. too worried. I may add a little bit more to it at some point. Um, but yeah, I mean, I thought the numbers were great. It just has the billings guidance is a little lower. Not a big deal. But I have to name two stocks that I they're one of my they're both some of my largest positions. I think they're actually become my largest positions now. Um, and phase and oh, sure. SMCI. And SMCI, and I've been taught. I've been in M phase since July 2020. Um, people are probably sick of hearing me say that, but um, <laughs> I have to say I'm proud of it. It's a great company, and they execute and they put out those numbers that we want and we need, especially in this constricting economy that we're in. In these compressed times, they're increasing their margins. They have their free cash flow little lower this quarter, not a big deal, still margin of 28%. Um, and this is off the top of my head, but great company. And they raised their, their European sales were up 70% when the dollar is near all near cycle highs. That's impressive. Earnings per share is up uh, like a few hundred percent from last year. Um, just beautiful numbers. And SMCI, another one, I'm sure you know them now. They raise their expectations for earnings. They come with their earnings. They beat significantly. And then they raise guidance again. They did this last quarter, and they did it again. And everyone can just pull up their earnings. I'm not going to go through them. But beautiful numbers, and I'm very long there as well. Uh, so those are two great companies. Once again, selective stock market. So you could say SMCI being in the tech growth sector, um, you know, you would think it wouldn't do as well, but it's an emerging leader, in my opinion. And it had a low PE, not that I use PE that heavily, but it was in like 12 or I don't know, 14 or something. So but look, to they, me, it's almost, they make money. it's like a value. Yeah, they, they make they, money. They actually, so I'm looking, I'm looking at the, at the yeah. numbers right now. They made $285 million over the last 12 months. Twilio lost a billion dollars yeah so, exactly <laughs> so if you've got and, and that goes back to our our original comment is cash flow if you have a company that's actually making money right now and end phase is also profitable they made 296 yes. million dollars so and, and i've got to tell you end phase is just it's a phenomenal chart they're the leader it's a high growth industry they continue to execute and, and it's like you said technology amazon's coming apart right now and the end phase chart is just below a potential breakout level exactly i i i see that exactly they execute and they just consistently um produce those numbers and they're um i mean they're just impressive and that's what i want to see and i i talk about them mostly to show people that there are emerging leaders, there are stocks out there and that are producing these numbers. You can't just dismiss the whole market. There are stocks and companies that are producing. I mean, Enphase, I was with them since the 50s. My average is higher than that because I added on the way up. Um, it's sure. a little higher than that. But 
they took market share from the inverter sales from Sedge. Sedge was the leader, Solar Edge, and back in 2020. And I remember I, at the time, was going to invest a little bit in Solar Edge and a little bit in Enphase. And then I just said, you know what? Which is the one that's going to have the most growth? And I went with Enphase, and I'm grateful that I did because now they are eating up Sedge's lunch. They are taking over that inverter sales and they're just growing and they're just doing a great job. It's the executive team. Badri is an excellent CEO. So great company. And I will remain with them until the growth changes because, you know, in all companies, no matter how great they are, it, you know, they, they, their growth can plateau at some point. But for right now, to me, they look like they just continue to grow. So I love them and SMCI, two great companies. Um, so they're, they're great to, to they're just, they give us all hope that there are things that are working. I mean, when we have the rise in the cost of debt, it's just common sense that cash would be so valuable. You want companies that have the cash that are producing the cash and that are increasing or at least maintaining their margins while, you know, costs are increasing. So agree completely. Um, and not yeah. only that, but we we should give you the nickname Enphase Rosanna from now on. Yeah. <laughs> if, if I'm if I'm blue chip Larry, but the key. Yes, thing, I'll take it. <laughs> one good thing I love about, it. About Enphase is this whole clean energy shift. I know that ESG gets a bad name because it's way, way, way overused. But there is a a shift to clean energy renewable energy and end yes. phase, they're, they're profitable. It looks like their projected five-year earnings growth rate is 38%, which is a, a huge number. And even if they don't hit 38%, I mean, the it's it's in, in the technology sector because that's technically where end phase is. I, it's probably the best chart off the top of my head as far as the majors. You know, it's a $40 billion market cap. Off the yes. top of my head, in technology, I can't think of a tech stock that's got that market cap that has that good of a chart. I'd have to think about it. I could be wrong, but I yeah, I, I agree. That, I think that Enphase, sure, for for some growth money and for people that can handle the volatility, I think it's it's one of the best ideas out there in tech. Exactly, you know, and that's why I love speaking about it because I want people to know that. If you do the work, and I do, I'm a math person, and I love the fi fundamental investing is, is my forte. That's what I do. I love fundamentals. And I mean, when you look at these numbers, I mean, the net income, I just pulled it up right now. Net income um, is up from last quarter, 50%, and then up 427% from a quarter last year. And then the earnings per share basic gap is up 431% from last year. I mean, significant growth. The pattern is intact. And their guidance, because it's all about the future, right? They're guiding in this in this market, they're still guiding an increase in their revenues of 10 to 15%. And remember, the past few quarters, their revenue has been record. Every quarter, it's a record revenue. So they're going for another record next quarter. So, I mean, this is what we want to see. I mean, their gross margins are now on about 40%. That's great. I mean, they're maintaining them. They actually raised their, their margins for gap from 41% to 42.2%. So that's what we want to see, increasing margins. A beautiful chart. If Blue Chip Larry says it's a great chart, you know it's a great chart. Because I have to say... <laughs> Your technicals are one of the best. I love your analysis of charts. Thank so, you. So, um, yeah, you, it's excellent. I, we all need to learn from you. It's Thank excellent. You. So, I appreciate it. Yeah, that. you're welcome. Absolutely. And so hearing it from you, I feel even better about being uh, long and heavy uh, with Enphase. Um, so, you know, talking about all these stocks and everything, um, are you watching – any earnings in particular? Do you watch the earnings or pay attention to them? I only, I, I don't read the earnings, but I pay attention to what the stocks do afterwards. So, because a company could report what, what we all think is good earnings, and then it's down 20%. And then they could report a number that we think is bad, and it's up 10%. So, 
I, I don't pay too much attention to the earnings as much as I do pay attention to what does the stock do after they report the earnings. Exactly. Yeah, the market reaction is key. That's the most important. Absolutely. I do, I do look afterwards. I do like to see, like everyone, I like to see growth. I like to see mm -hmm. sales growth. I like to see earnings growth. I like to see good margins. So that's always icing on the cake. But I, I, I really pay attention more to what the charts are doing with it. Great. Yes, it's great. It's very important. Um, what are your thoughts? Are you watching the bond market? I know you posted that TNX chart, the yield chart. Um, what are your thoughts on the bond yields and the runaway dollar? Uh, let's talk about that briefly. Um, are you watching TLT for an eventual reversal? Are you interested in maybe entering it at some point for that reversal? Definitely at some point. But I think so, so bond yields are, are what worries me. So the, the first thing I do when I wake up, it, it could be four o'clock in the morning. The first thing I do is fire up CNBC and I look where bond yield, where the 10 year bond yield is, because I can generally tell just how the entire day is going to go. Just if I know what, what bond yields are doing, because bond yields, and I've posted charts on this before, the stock market is just along for the ride. The, the stock market is like your five-year-old child in the back seat of the minivan and, and bond yields are the driver because whatever the bond market wants to do, it, it's going to let the stock market do whatever happens from there. So I do pay attention to bond yields. I, I'd rather not see them go any higher. It's, it's a tough call because if the Fed is going to, going to keep hiking and maybe get to 450, 475, or 5%, then that's going to keep pressure, upward pressure on bond yields, and it's going to keep upward pressure on the U.S. dollar. And that generally does keep downward pressure on the stock market. So that's really the, I, I keep the bond yield screen is on my terminal all day, every day. I know what it's doing all the time. Exactly. I, me too. I'm always watching that yield. And uh, I always look at the two year, the 10 year, the three mile. I just I look at all of them. And yeah, I've been paying it especially close attention to the, you know, the 10 year tip as well. And comparing it with the NASDAQ earnings yield for the equity risk premium and seeing it as such a low, it just doesn't bode well for the NASDAQ stocks, you know, because the valuations and prices should be coming down for to maintain that spread. So agree completely. We need to look to the bond market and the bond yields specifically for what it's going to tell us about the stocks. Quick, so, I've got absolutely. a quick question for you. My, mm -hmm. my, my earbuds just told me that I have a low battery and I'm not sure where my charger is. If, if my earbuds go off, can I do this from my phone? Yes, you can okay. do it from your phone directly. You can't do it from your computer, but you can do it from your phone. Okay, if, if you lose me for a second, because I, I don't think ah. my earbuds, I should have charged them. Um, oh, okay. If if you lose me, it, it will just be temporary, and I will jump right in uh, on the phone. Yes. Okay. Great. That's great. If we lose you for a second, we'll just stay. No, we won't. We promise we won't leave you. Play we'll be song. here. We'll be waiting. Talk about NPs, <laughs> revenue growth, something like that. Right. I know. Well, hopefully you'll come join me. Maybe if it pulls back, if the market takes a dive, uh, you can hop in as well. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to move it higher up my list. That's for sure. Absolutely. I talked about it last time we met. I guess you just weren't listening. <laughs> I, I, I was. I know. I know you have a plot. You have plenty of excellent ones. Um, and speaking of which, I know you mentioned that you have Oxy and you're holding the Dow ETF. Does that mean that you are in? Mostly cash, or you also have some short positions. I, I've got some some put positions that I took about a month or so ago. But when I take those positions, 
I just assume that they're going to expire. I'm not actively looking to short anything right now. What, what I found, I, I don't do well trying to trade both sides of the market at the same time. So if I want to focus on the long side, which is what I'm looking at right now, then I really just want to stay focused on the long side. And if I want to look to short things, because there's a lot of, a lot of things to short in the NASDAQ 100, but I've got mostly cash and I'm looking to scale some of that in tomorrow, next week, you know, into this volatility, but it's really going to be in those four sectors that we've talked about. Exactly. Absolutely. Oh, speaking of renewables, First Solar is doing awesome. I don't have a position there, but I've been watching that chart and they went up 5% today. And I mean, I don't think their earnings were like in phase at all, but um, yeah, they're, they're definitely looking very strong. So that's, that's another big, one. Big, big mover for sure. Exactly. Been very strong. Um, I did not look at their earnings. I did not read it from what I heard, the, you know, the analysis of it. Um, I guess not, no one can be as good as my end phase, right? <laughs> but phase, uh, the numbers, yeah. their numbers are great. So um, I, I'll have to look at these numbers. But yeah, they're up. First Solar is another strong one um, as well. So you're holding some short positions like SPY. I know you said you in SPY and crude as well. Is that correct? I, I've, got, I've got some December crude puts, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that position won't work because I, I had taken some profits in it before and I rolled them down. And then OPEC uh, took some supply out of the market. So I really think that OPEC put a floor in crude oil. Crude oil is actually looking pretty good if it can start to get over maybe 95. Uh, but but my short positions right now aren't. I've got some Tesla uh, puts if that were to break below 200. But, but those are really small positions that when I took them, I just assumed that they weren't going to work out. But the, the reward versus the risk was too good for, for the small amount that I risked. But I'm not looking to short anything right now. I'd rather hold more cash, uh, yes. you know, look for some of these pullbacks. It, because what happens with these, these short rallies is they can be very, very sharp. And it's, I try in a higher volatility market like this, I, I really want to try to less. Yes. Can you, um, can you hear me now? I hear you sound great. Okay, my 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 earbuds finally gave up, but if you can hear me now, that's great. Yeah, I actually hear you better now. Oh, so perfect. you sound very good. Okay, great. Yeah, it sounds great. So yeah, so I guess you could call your put positions lotto, right? As some people say. <laughs> you know, I I you could. I'm not a fan <laughs> of the term, but they really. I know you are. They. <laughs> that's why I said they, it. They they really are the the Tesla chart. The, if the Tesla chart would have broken 200, then the downside probably would have come really, really quickly. But the, the market held up. We put in that low after the CPI. And so I, and I would rather not see Tesla on, on my short positions. I'd rather that I don't want these stocks to go down, but the, the reward versus the risk if that Tesla chart broke below 200, it was, it was fast downside, but it didn't as of yet. I'd rather that it doesn't, but yeah, they're, they're basically, you could call them lottos. Absolutely. Lottos. They're like hedge lottos. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. That's right. I know. I know you don't like the terms. That's why I use it. But yeah, you're not. I don't call you a gambling type. Yes. I guess when you hear the word lotto, you think of gambling. Right. But, um, you know, um, as Aristotle says, knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom. And you know what works for you and your style and your strategy. And you don't, you know, you're not looking to short per se. These are just more for hedge protection in case we do go that route. And if we do, um, you know, these, these will definitely pay heavily, uh, but hopefully not. I hope we don't go that route and hopefully we can maintain it where we are and, and 
you know, reverse to the upside, that would be nice for all of us. But I, I don't feel that that is the case, like we discussed before. And I think there could be much worse to come based on all the macro and all the issues going on. Like, like you said, I love the point you made, Larry. Um, what catalyst is going to cause institutional or fund managers to run out and want to buy Amazon or Google or Meta for that, for that, um, for that instance as well. So we're going to have to see some type of bottoming of some sort and for them to some kind of catalyst for them to want to buy, because I, I know you and I are, are don't want it. We don't have that on our buy list. No. So, um, no. and those are a big part of the NASDAQ. So what's going to stop that from going lower? Um, you and I are both wondering, um, any lasting final ideas or war or words, Larry, uh, besides being more defensive, I love these industries we talked about and energy, healthcare, industrials. Um, and I think you touched upon some financials as well. Goldman Sachs has is, is always been great, in my opinion. Oh, sure. Solid, solid, I, you know, just solid. I, I think what what people really need to do just from a, from a chart perspective is is take the symbol off the chart and forget that it's Amazon and forget that it's Microsoft and that they're great companies and they'll probably be around for the next 50 years. We have to forget that because the the stock performance and the investment return is not the same thing as the quality of the company. So Microsoft can be a great company, but but the stocks go through cycles. The economy goes through cycles. I'm sure that if if we do a podcast together 10 years from now, Microsoft will probably be making new highs or it'll be a leader. But, but for right now, the, the economy is focused on there's going to be an economic slowdown. So you can't take interest rates from 0% to 5%. Mortgage rates are at 20-year highs. Inflation's at 40-year highs. Consumers are getting squeezed at, on their mortgage payment, their rent payment, their food price, everything. So there's going to be an economic slowdown. I don't think there's anyone that, that doesn't think that as far as if we get a, 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 a recession, a soft landing, any of that stuff. I don't know. I don't try to predict it when it's going to happen. But I would just expect that the economy slows down. And and when that happens, then these tech stocks, you know, Amazon, they're in consumer discretionary. People buy less things. So I would say. Forget about that it's Amazon and forget about that it's General Mills and, oh, you know, who wants to buy Merck? Rosanna's dad was buying it in the 80s. You know, <laughs> at, at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is, number one, is your money safe? And then number two, are you making money? But the, the first thing people always, you know, FOMO, people talk about FOMO on the upside. It's much worse on the downside. Because if you hold a stock like, you know, it's gone from 200 to 89, Amazon, I think was 180 and now it's 89 and people are continuing to hold that on the way down. It's the fear of missing that big rally. Guess what? It's probably not coming right now because the Fed is not anybody's friend. There's no Fed put. They're not going to come out with QE. Powell doesn't care about the stock market. And I think mm -hmm. people just need... Powell, he's not anybody, he's not here to bail anyone out. And, and I think that people just need to realize, hey, you know, it, it's going to be, you know, some bumpy times and focus on, you know, have a lot of cash. You know, don't try to do too much. Don't try to buy everything and short everything and, and do all this stuff. And, you know, just look at the charts and say, you know, what's working right now? And if this hiking cycle continues for the next three or six months, then I would probably expect that what's been working will keep working and what hasn't been working won't won't be working. And then, listen, it'll change maybe in a year, whenever they start to cut rates, whenever they say we're going to cut, you know, it's parties over, we're going to start to cut rates. 
then some of these stocks, you know, Amazon, Microsoft, they're going to have their day in the sun again. But holding stocks from 190 to 80 in these massive downtrends and then buying more just doesn't make any sense. Wise words. Thank you. That was beautiful. Very well said. Um, I mean, there's a divergence between the company and stock price, and they don't always reflect. The stock price is not always reflective of the company, and people need to understand that. I mean, we've been doing this a long time. I think, yeah, I've been doing this since late 90s, 2000, basically. So I'm very familiar with that as well. And, you know, we, we um, you know, there's a reset going on because of the higher rates. And we talked about the equity risk premium. Um, and we don't know the E and the PE, the earnings. There's earnings under pressure. And we saw it last quarter. We're seeing it this quarter. There's not only are margins getting compressed, which we've already experienced, but there's a slowdown, like you said. And there's a lower uh, future valuations are, are coming down as well with these higher rates. And we're going to feel that more in quarter four and into next year. So to me, my opinion is ne mid next year could maybe be a point where we can start seeing some type of change. Um, you know, sometime next year, I'm hopeful before the end of the new year that we can see some, you know, sustained upside, but we need to work through this. And hopefully I'm, I'm hope I'm wrong. I hope it happens sooner. That would be great. Um, but yeah, I mean, stop being a hero and trying to keep buying the dip. You know, it's important that, you know, you do what works for you. You don't follow others into trades. You do your own thing. But risk management is number one. And I, you know, I believe reduced position sizes are, if you're going to be invested or trading, try to go a little smaller. And like you said, scale into positions. You know, it takes you about a month to work your way into a position like the industrials or any of these others that are working. No reason to go and buy it all out tomorrow. Scale into it slowly because it could come back down. It's very volatile. This market, you know, has big swings both ways. So it's better to have patience and scale in slowly. So um, agree completely. Um, you know, blue chip, Larry, could you please tell us about your blue chip daily trend premium report that you offer for everyone? Sure. And, and I'm glad to say that you are one of our members. Glad to have you. I'm proud. I'm a proud member. I'm a proud thank, member. Thank you. Bluechipdaily.com is the website. And, and basically, it's a lot of what we've just talked about. I focus primarily on large cap stocks and I focus on price, trend, charts, things like that. Uh, we've got the, the members private Twitter feed where I'm posting through the day, not only things to buy, but things that I think should be sold or should be avoided. We do the nightly members video uh, and, and it's been, it's, it's a lot of fun. It, it's really a passion for me to follow the markets. I'm in the markets. Uh, I'm watching Bloomberg at midnight. It's just something that I, I love to do. But the uh, the website is bluechipdaily.com. We do have a 30-day free trial. People can, can sign up for free, get the full members' benefits, and then see what they think about it. But that's the, uh, that's the site, bluechipdaily.com. Great. Awesome. Everyone, make sure you check out Blue Chip Daily Trend Premium Report, or as you said, uh, bluechipdaily.com. Make sure you follow Blue Chip Larry, but he's also known as, what is your name on there? Larry Tantarelli. I mean, how, that's my, what a well, long that's, name. <laughs> that's my name everywhere. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but my, my Twitter, I, I did the Twitter tonight because I've got the app on my phone. So my, my call sign is at... L M T nine seven eight. Wow, what is the significance of nine seven eight? If you don't mind me asking, that was at the time. So originally, when I set up my Twitter, nobody could ever get my name right. So they always misspelled it, and nobody could look it up. So at the time, that was my area code in Massachusetts. So oh, cool. No one, when people meet me, they never get my name right. So I said, let me just make it. And, and keep in mind, when I first 
set up my Twitter handle. It was 2013 and I had two followers and I didn't know anything about Twitter. So I'm like, okay, this, you know, it's just the Twitter handle. And now I have to, if I figure out how to change it to my name, then I have to figure out what to do with the old handle because everyone knows me for 10 years now as LMT978. Very cool. Thank you for telling us. Interesting story. Right, it is. I was always wondering what that number was. Maybe a social security or number or something. Oh, yeah, that's what I want to put on social media. (laughs) (laughs) All right. I know. Oh. Well, I have to say it's like- been fun. I love I love talking to you. Um, and you know what I admire most about you is your steadfast nature. You're very consistent and very patient. And um, in times of high volatility, you always remain calm. And um, it's very admirable. Maybe you inside, deep and down inside you aren't, but you really display that image and you're very calming for everyone so thank you blue chip larry and um as the famous charlie munger once said and i love quoting him because not only is he great in investing but he says some really wise quotes he has the best thing a human being can do is help another human being no more so i hope that is what we accomplished here this evening and it was the utmost pleasure to speak with you Larry, you are so awesome and you're so kind. So thank you. And thank you all the listeners for joining us this evening. We appreciate all of you. And until next time, be well. Thank you for listening to the Rose Show podcast. Please visit rosannaprestia.com for more episodes. See you soon.